Have you ever discovered something unbelievable? Something life-changing? Something so profound that it changes the way you see the world? And then, when you finally summon the words to tell someone, you're met with a condescending head nod and that classic line that your generation will save us. Someday you'll know and you know what I'm going to say I've been feeling this way for far too long Now, imagine that thing is existential, that it transcends politics and defies borders. You've watched people deny it, downplay it, and use it to further their own agenda. There are so many others that see it too, but you're all deemed too young to have a say. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is sleepwalking to its demise, and you're powerless, helpless, voiceless. When you look out at the world, you see only greed, cynicism, and a ruling class. You're simultaneously paralyzed by anxiety and broken down by the guilt and fear of inaction. And all the while, everyone is saying that it's your generation that will save them. I am growing up in a world of climate chaos. It's also a world in which I cannot vote. A world where I do not have a say in my future and where the course of my life will largely be determined by white men in suits. It's not fair. But what if I started a movement of people whose voices are absent in decision making? And what if we reached into the heart of power and demanded change? Now there's an interesting idea. My name is Jessie Stevens, and in 2021, I created a movement of people cycling to the COP26 summit in Glasgow. My journey began on the south coast of the UK, and along the way, I spoke to as many people as possible so I could bring everybody's voice to the so-called heart of power. But make no mistake, this is not a hero's journey. My name's Jessie and I'm a climate concerned young person and in 2021 I founded the movement People Pedal Power which is made up of climate concerned people all across the country moving towards COP to raise awareness for the issue. When you know about the crisis you want to do anything you can to, to make it better. I think it's that human instinct to want to be in control and I suppose when you feel so out of control taking action is one of the only things you can do to make yourself feel better and I think that can mean that as a teenager you don't have that same carefree existence because you're constantly feeling you have to give time to to making a difference and you can't just sit back and, and watch it all. It's not easy to rest or to just relax because you know that time is slipping away. I'm nervous because I've never done anything like this before so I think it's going to be quite nerve-wracking tomorrow morning but I think as soon as you guys said as soon as you get on the road it's going to be Bit easier and get into the rhythm. I think just the mental and body stuff because I've never, I've never cycled that far for that long day after day so I think it's a bit of all of that all muddled into one yeah. COP stands for Conference of the Parties which is basically a big UN climate conference where diplomats and delegates and politicians from all over the world come to discuss the climate crisis um, and what we can do to mitigate it. Has COP the past being a success? No, because then we wouldn't have had 26 of them. Yeah, and nobody wants mechanical, so I'm really worried about that because I just don't want like my bottom bracket to fall off or something like that. <laughs> it's all new to me. Um, I think we often live quite contained lives and when you do adventures like this, you really do see the kindness of people and you see the collaboration between people, which I think we just keep our heads down and, and get on with life. So I think it's going to be nice to really share experiences with people and um, sort of take that unknown and yeah. I really, really wanted to attend the summit to, to bring the youth voice and the perspective along with many other young people. Um, but then I found that there was two big issues that were stopping me from getting there. 
The first big issue was that it was really expensive for me to get there sustainably. And to me, this seemed really wrong because, you know, to be able to make sustainable transport infrastructure more accessible to everybody, it needs to be cheaper. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to fully decarbonise our transport sector. The second issue that I faced was gatekeeping. I naively thought that COP would be a, a really good, easy place to get into. You know, I thought it'd be an amazing experience for everyone to share their ideas about how to mitigate the climate crisis and make a difference. But what I found out was very, very different. It's such a heavily politicised event with so much gatekeeping that it means that the average people whose voices need to be heard the most because it's the climate crisis is going to impact them the first and the hardest aren't heard and they can't get in. And so um, that's where the idea of people pedal power came from because I just thought both of these issues are so wrong and, and how can we both bring people together to, to mobilise against this and for this and, and how can we spread more awareness and understanding about it. That sounded very wordy and political. Is that all right? Is that all right? The journey was starting from my hometown in Newton Abbott and travelling 570 miles up the UK to Glasgow. That was 500 miles more than I'd ever cycled back to back. On the way, we'd be passing through hilly Devon, the flat Midlands, mountainous Lake District and the rolling hills of the Scottish Lowlands. We planned a bunch of overnight stops with a few rest days thrown in for good measure and we hoped to be in Glasgow after 12 long days of pedalling. And just like that, the road stretched out 600 miles in front of us. 600 miles worth of opportunities for collaboration and conversation. And what better way to meet new people than to ask a bunch of wonderful strangers to ride our support cargo bike for different stages of the journey. When I first got on, <laughs> I was quite concerned because I almost fell off straight away. But then Graham told me to look straight ahead and now I feel kind of confident now, <laughs> apart from all the extra rucksacks that are going on it. <laughs> That's Ben, our second cargo rider and father of nine-year-old climate-concerned Polly. You didn't mishear me, she's nine years old and anxious about the climate crisis. When I uh, explained to Polly, my daughter, that you, that okay. you were doing this, yeah. and we were, we were talking about, oh, what, she was like, well, what can I, what can I, how can I kind of contribute or how can I tell Jessie what I think, and I, we went, we went with the letter, and uh, really expressing what, what I think a lot of young people feel that she doesn't, you know, she feels angry about it, but she doesn't yeah. feel that she can do anything about it. I think it's just that young people just feel so powerless, and I know I have in in past for so long, yeah. and doing this kind of action makes me feel empowered and yeah. makes me feel like I've got a small amount of control on on these huge uncontrollable things which hang over my future. I, I often feel. Dear Jessie. My name is Polly Sutton and I am nine years old. Thank you for raising awareness about climate change through your cycle to COP26 and highlighting the need for real action, not just words. I feel like politicians talk about climate change a lot, but never actually take any real action. The policies they decide on now will have a direct effect on our future. Sadly, I'm not old enough to join you, but I am extremely excited that my daddy is going to ride the cargo bike for a bit. I hope that all the people you talk to on your ride are as passionate and caring about the environment as you and I are. I wish you a lot of luck. Polly. I know it's the oldest cliche in the book, but that first day really was quite a whirlwind. But what really stuck with me was Polly's letter. Of all the people I would pass en route to COP, how many really cared about the climate crisis? Certainly not everybody. Something I was optimistic about though, and something that I didn't necessarily expect, was just how brilliant the act of cycling is for facilitating conversation and connection. Like every, every person's just, you go in straight at the deep end, you cut out all the usual fluff of daily life and exchanges about the weather and what their job is and it just, you just jump in at the important stuff and the interesting stuff like I was chatting to that guy about cycling to Sweden it was like I don't know anything about him but it was just so much fun and it's such a good way to connect in a kind of relaxed way but important way and yeah 
No one mentioned the 16% hill. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> message that you want to tell people when you get there or is the message itself the journey? I think it's both. I think by, with the journey we're just trying to highlight the power of collective action, of, of kindness of strangers, of, of what happens and the power we have when we all come together to, to demand change and, and want, yeah, want, things, want, want a different world. I think the mainstream media really did want to put me on the pedestal and make me the hero and actually say when I did an interview I, I would always make it very clear and, and ask them to keep adding in that it was a movement it wasn't just me and that's not because I'm trying to be like oh you know I'm the hero but don't think about me you know it's actually that I it wasn't about me it was about everybody the media is, is so black and white there's no scope for the grey area of actually community action and a movement and strength in numbers is going to be the thing that's going to make the difference. We just want that easy story and that easy narrative of his one person doing something cool and then it's just like, but what about everybody else? bought a box of three magnums and there was only two of us so I had one this morning for breakfast. Second breakfast I had a good hearty bagel and porridge. Started the day off well but second breakfast was a vegan chocolate magnum and I stand by my decisions though feeling slightly sick now. <laughs> That's Vera, our fifth cargo bike rider. She joined us with her husband Matt, our sixth cargo bike rider, with a tandem bike in tow so they could ride back to Porter's Head at the end of the leg. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I've struggled with is that helplessness and anxiety feeling with yeah. everything that's going on in the world. Totally. And you know, you kind of feel like we need, we need, it's great that as individuals we can take those small steps, you know? Yeah. Cutting out new products and plastic. Plastics and buying, buying less and, yeah. and that. But when you think about it, it's a drop in the ocean and we need, we need um, bigger change. Yeah. We need our leaders to make those changes. And I find that they're not, really doing that in yes. terms of that effect on mental health and things do you feel do you find the same are you do you deal with that a bit like anxiety or are you quite optimistic I think I flip between the two yeah I think some days I'm so thoughtful about I can't go in the car I can't do this it's you know 20 minutes in the car I feel so guilty other days I go you know what there's people flying their private jets all over the world right now yeah what what this difference does this make yeah and I think it's so hard and these personal and political action or systems change they're so they interact so much and big corporations are so happy to place the onus on the individual because yeah. it means they can get away with what exactly. they're doing for far longer. Yeah. All of this got me thinking more and more about where responsibility lies. At any given moment, who is in charge of saving the planet? After all, it was BP, one of the biggest oil giants on Earth, who coined the term carbon footprint. And they did it with the explicit intention of shifting blame and responsibility for the climate crisis away from themselves and onto individuals. And more importantly, onto individuals who have barely contributed to the climate crisis. The people who cause the least impact on the climate are yeah. feeling it the most. No, absolutely. So, like, I'm from Malawi, yeah. which is one of the poorest countries in the world. One of the, in terms of 
um, um, carbon footprint of people and our activities yeah. are extremely low. Of course. But the changes that we're seeing from you know climate change and the like yeah. is drastic. You know, yeah. we're getting a lot more droughts, heavy rainfall, the same. But but it's not like oh, we haven't reaped the rewards of of, of this. Of you know, the growth and, yeah, and all of that. Yeah, we haven't got all of that, but we're yeah. suffering. Yeah. And it's, it's really hard. And again, it's difficult to convince people there to sort of change their lifestyles as well, because we're everyone's aspiring yeah. to the life that people have in the West. Yes. You know? That's so interesting. Yeah. And, and so it's like, no, you, you've got to cut down on this, you've got to cut down on that. But we haven't got that yet. We haven't exactly. got there yet. And it's totally. Here at the speed. Am I going to be judged on how I tie my laces? No. I feel it could be a controversial thing. I feel like in this world we're so divided. I'm sure someone's got a thing about. How you tie your laces. How do you tie your laces, Jesse? If you don't double knot, who are you? Do I sense judgment? <laughs> I am the judger. <laughs> you know what? It's so divided. I am the judger. Day four, and my body and mind weren't just surviving, they were thriving. Sorry, really cringy, I know, but it was true. Every morning, so many different bikes would turn up, each carrying yet more potential for conversation. I mean, we would never run into Mel, just as she was finishing her hand cycle around Britain, if we'd have been in a car. The bike can literally take you anywhere, can't it? You know, it can take you on any and every journey, it doesn't matter how short or how far. Mm. Like, I started to think last night, I've cycled around Britain, you know, it hasn't quite sunk in, yeah. but then I sort of every now and again have this like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I would never think to do that in a car for many reasons, but you know, that's, you can go wherever. It's like cars, the bigger the, bigger the car is, the more freedom people think they have. It's yes. bigger, it's more spacious, but actually the less freedom they have because they're so disconnected from the outside world. Whereas on the bike, you're on a tiny small thing and it's quite, you know, you feel quite vulnerable sometimes, but actually you're so exposed to the elements and, and nature that actually it's such a better way to travel. Mm. But it's like this this urge for people with wealth and, and just status want these big cars, but it doesn't, it's the perceived power and status that you get from it, but it doesn't mean anything, you just get more disconnected. Exactly. have all those different bikes. I have the fat bike. And then there's the road bikes. And then we've got a hand bike. We've got the cargo bike. And it's just... Yeah, yeah brilliant to have all these bikes. And yeah, I like that bike on a bike. Yeah. <laughs> on a bike. bike all these section. different people. But everyone's just riding a bike and just go, you know, you can get anywhere. You can all go the same way. You can all go on a journey on all these different bikes. And it's just beautiful. <laughs> One thing that was missing, though, was more young people. Cause strike and the streets are full of us. But from a young age, we're not taught that riding bikes is a way of protesting. In fact, we're not taught about the climate crisis at all. Why is there no climate education in the curriculum? I think for so long, adults haven't thought it's that important to teach young people about, which I find quite baffling because the climate crisis is our future. So why wouldn't you teach it about it? Because schools are meant to set us up for our future and careers and, and being prosperous in life. But actually, you're not teaching us about the main thing that's going to impact us. I think it just doesn't really add up. It's interesting to talk to other young people about, about how they view it, because I feel like there's been so many adults on this journey. And, I mean, adults are great because they've got lots of power. But actually, <laughs> how cool would it be if we had the voice that we could, we could make change? I mean, young people's voices are so, like, precious because it... I guess that's the effect is it's going to affect us you know, totally. the, yeah. and the future generations. It's really important for young people to learn about the climate crisis at school because that's how we can support people's mental health as well because, you know, climate anxiety and, and all of these things are skyrocketing because it's like a taboo subject and we're not taught about it in the most open and safe way possible. How do you feel when you're on this course right um, That the... It's coming to light a lot more, 
you know, um, people, young people are demanding for their voices to be heard um, a lot more, which is really good. It's quite an impactful experience, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. I always come away feeling really positive and, and like, like we can make a change, because I think sometimes when you're sitting in your bedroom at home and you're looking on Instagram and it's just all so doom and gloom, mm. and then you see the sort of reality TV and you think, well, they've got all this money and they're not doing anything. And we're just looking at those kind of, I suppose, more frivolous stuff in life. It's so nice to be with other young people who feel the same. Yeah. women are very good at cargo bike handling and they do like cool riding without brakes which sounds a bit crazy but they seem to enjoy it <laughs> not on the road What was your dinner last night? We were already talking about dinner this morning. Not a good look. You can tell we're hungry. Um, falafel? Couscous? Peas? Lay on the floor eating a carrot because I was so tired. What weird and wonderful things riding bikes can do to you. Climate anxiety is real and it's a lot to deal with. But when tackling the issue head on, you've got to find things that make you laugh. And weird food combinations seem to be my speciality. Hot water, hot chocolate sachet from the Airbnb today. Wasn't going to let that one slip. Cocoa Pops. Don't knock till you try it. And when all you need is sugar. And I found a packet of Cocoa Pops in my pannier and then I just tipped them in and they kind of had like a marshmallowy consistency. So that was quite good. Yeah. Meanwhile, Russ, our 13th cargo bike rider, was getting a little bit distracted by the scenery. Oh, look at this. This is amazing. <laughs> We're gonna, gonna catch Jesse up. We're coming. You're not far off. Russ works for Elove, a cargo bike delivery and logistics organisation based in Macclesfield. So really, he's a dab hand at a cargo bike, even if we did stick him on a canal towpath for a bit. I remember when we said emergency kick. Why? Canal toe path hit us all a bit hard, particularly the tyres and the bums. As COP drew nearer, I was starting to wonder what would ultimately shape the policy decisions and climate commitments we all hoped would come from the conference. Would the science be listened to? Because the facts are pretty stark. Yes, yeah, so I work on um, ice in Antarctica and understanding how it's changing in a changing climate. So why certain areas are melting faster? What are the, like, um, the different things that contribute to that? So is it that the air temperature is getting higher? Is it that the oceans around the continent are getting warmer? Yeah. And trying to uh, put some kind of physics understanding behind that. So understand the kind of physics of the system. Okay so that people can feed that into these predictive models they use yes, um, yeah. to forecast what's going to happen in the future in terms of sea level rise. Because um, totally. of course, um, the, the Antarctic ice sheets are the largest storage of fresh water we have That's on incredible. our planet. Yeah. And if they all melt, it's gonna raise sea level by a huge amount, um, 60, 70 meters or so wow. globally. And yeah. that's 
going to put an awful lot of places underwater so yeah. we want to know the time scale yeah. under which that might happen um, and understand which areas are going to be most vulnerable first. And how do you actually, when you get all these facts through, how do you deal with it? How do you not get paralysed by, because you're, you know, you're at the real big end of all the facts and, yeah. and seeing it and going to the Arctic and how do you sort of mentally deal with that? I think because it's been one of these things and this goes back to communication that's been yeah. really well understood in polar science for such a long time. Yeah. It's somehow not, it's not new and it's not as shocking okay. um, to people who've been working on it. And that really tells you that we've not been communicating it very well because it is shocking to other people. Um, and a lot of these things have been known about for a very long time in the, the kind of the research community that look at them. Yeah, so, totally. Um, I suppose that's maybe why it's not quite so shocking or stressful. Um, yeah. But it can be. You do definitely feel like it's, what's the point um, sometimes? Yeah, totally. Because you're doing all this very, very fine scale research. Yeah, um, yeah, very much But so. actually it doesn't change the big picture very much. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I'm going to be really cross. What do you yeah. have for breakfast? Um, chocolate porridge, oats, water, raisins, and chocolate. And peas. I had peas for breakfast. Didn't have an apple, didn't have a banana, didn't have anything like that. We had a bag of peas. So I had a peas in a glass and I drank them. Okay, full disclosure, we'd had a chat the morning we left Lancaster about just how sensible it was riding into an amber weather warning. There was set to be widespread flooding and gale force winds, and our route was going right through the eye of the storm. The irony of the situation was not lost on us either. This was yet another extreme weather event occurring in the UK, something which was a once in a decade occurrence not long ago. Yet there we were, watching roads become rivers and diverting east to avoid a couple of bridges that had quite literally been washed away. I think it'll be all right now that we're over those reeds. Oh, I think that's sewage. Oh no, is it? I think it might be. River crossings complete and we finally made it to Scotland. And who was there to welcome us but Stephen from Bikes for Refugees, who opened our eyes to more of the stark impacts that the climate crisis will bring to our collective doorstep. Sun's out, basking, yeah. basking in the sunshine. Oh, you need to take your coat off, Steve. Yeah, it's so yeah, hot. It's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> Bikes for Refugees, uh, yeah, it started, I set it up about four and a half years ago. And we're here and we want to raise some awareness around uh, around climate refugees as well. Totally, you know, which is a big mass mass movement of people ever, isn't it? Uh, uh, so, yeah. are, you, are you worried about what's to come for, for, for well, Bikes for Refugees and, and the increased need for them? It's estimated that by 2050, there will be 1.2 billion, not million, but 1.2 billion displaced people as a direct result of, of climate change, food and water shortages, and uh, and yeah, and disasters, climate disasters around the world. 1.2 billion people displaced communities. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's not. Uh, it, it's it should be a wake up call to us all. Last big day. Tell us about the last couple of days because we haven't had the camera out much. That's because it's been atrocious weather and we've all been pretty miserable. So that's why the camera hasn't been out. But today the rain's supposed to be clearing. Final push. Well no, second to final push, but the final big day. 
And for our final big day, we were joined by Naomi from Cargo Bike Movement and James, our adventure photographer. And they rode the whole day with us on one electric cargo bike. Or actually, to be specific, Naomi pedalled all day while James chatted and took photographs. The storm was passing and we were only 48 hours away from the start of COP. But actually, I just wanted to keep going. As the rain passed, we were all filled with this overwhelming sense of optimism. The climate crisis is scary, but you don't always have to look hard to find solutions. It's so cool to have you today on your really cool cargo bike. And like having had the cargo bike the whole day, yeah. um, the whole way, is just like highlighting those solutions. We didn't want the movement just to be about shouting about what's wrong and the lack of infrastructure and all of that. We wanted to say, this is all really bad, based. but here's the solution. Yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. so cool to have those kind of two conversations about what's wrong and what needs to change, but also look at what we can do and like have your enthusiasm and, and have like sort of such a unique cargo bike movement which we hope won't be unique in the future because you want it to be widespread yeah but to have those kind of like sort of views into the future of what what things could be like i think you're right and it's actually very exciting how many different cargo bike organizations are setting up across the uk like you said you had russ join you um from macclesfield and there's loads going on in london and there's stuff going on in bristol and oxford and um, and, actually, and, and Lancashire and, and you know there's so many things happening it's just a matter of A joining that up but B like talking about it and saying like yeah. it's kind of not a new idea and, and you mentioned uh, like post workers going back to that style of like this style yeah. of delivery like, we've done it before yeah, so it let's fine. yeah it worked fine like maybe we needed a bit more um, investment and, and, and stuff put in to, to keep up with the level of deliveries that there are but it's not impossible, it's not ludicrous, and we could just do it if there was the will and the desire to do so, I think. Yeah, I think it's that, it's that will from people and politics to actually make these changes and to implement them, because actually it's, it's all there, it's the mental health, it's, yeah. it's the lack of congestion, it's, it's all of these like hundreds of different yeah. problems that are solved, and it's like if there was the will, people could actually join the dots together and say, ah, oh, here's the solution to everything, then there you go. It's a solution to most things. No, yeah, I not mean, everything. I'm a fan of cargo bikes. Yeah, <laughs> sure it's going to solve everything. No, no, but yeah, most things you yeah, can do with a cargo absolutely. bike. Absolutely. You've ridden one? Not yet. Oh, Jesse. Please sort that right out. I know, I know. Exciting. I'm excited to go on it, actually. Yeah, we should just put yeah. you on it. Right, you. <laughs> yeah, I'll give up tomorrow <laughs> yeah. and I'll just be like, I'm, exactly. not, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I'm sitting Take on there. Take me in my chariot. <laughs> We're done, we're ready. We're like almost toasty. Ready for the musical jump? One, two, three. just like the first day that the rain had really gone for so many days and we were sort of st starting to thaw and dry out um, and Catherine the filmmaker had two punctures on like a double puncture on her tyres and we all got involved in the pumping up and, and sung songs to help and it sounds really really silly but it was just really joyful and really fun and it just felt really chill and happy because I think the days before had been a bit stressful and quite draining to be with really lovely people and just have that really fun time was just so lovely. Finding the joyful moments in an issue like the climate crisis is so important and if this journey has taught me anything is that there's nothing quite like an adventure for moments of pure joy and bringing people together. Is any adventure truly complete without drama before the finish line? 
Mum had got the train up to join us for the final few days, but her bike had given up just 20 miles outside of Glasgow. But who should pop up at that very moment? Stephen from Bikes for Refugees and his trusty cargo bike, with just enough room for Mum to cruise into Glasgow on the back. Here we were after 12 days of pedalling and a year's worth of planning. We'd made it to COP26. The autumnal colours had turned urban and the enormity of the next few weeks weighed heavy in the air. But before anything too serious, I still hadn't actually ridden the cargo bike. No time like the present. <laughs> Don't look at me! Are they not? Phew. This is light, why was everyone complaining? I feel like such a different person. I feel so much older. It's so weird. And I think as a young person, you change so much in like a few months. And I think that experience changed me so much. I go back as a little tiny young person. And I know I don't look any different, but you feel different. And it's just, yeah, interesting. Getting to Glasgow felt really serious. It felt like the next part of the journey was about to begin, but it also felt like like this big dark cloud came over everything. I mean, it, it was quite dark because, you know, it was Scotland in the autumn, but it, it metaphorically felt like the energy changed. I think everyone was very edgy all around Glasgow because of what was gonna happen. It was very unknown. So I think what was weird about COP was you had the green zone and the blue zone. So the green zone was where you had all the brands and, and um, it was in the science centre. And that was weird because it was very sort of greenwashy. It was very much, look at what we're doing, open to the public, let's come and engage in climate, but actually you're just trying to sell me stuff, which felt very wrong. And then you had this completely different thing, which was the blue zone, which I also was very lucky to go into, which was close to the public, where you had the politicians and... Um, diplomats and, and all of these things where all the decisions were being made and it almost felt like the green zone was like a distraction from what was going on in the blue zone and it just felt like a real diverting of attention away from actually what was going on or more importantly what wasn't going on but what I found a lot of joy in was for the first week I was in the blue zone um, and then the second week I was out on the streets um, going to community groups and, and engaging in all the other people that I'd spent so long on Zoom with or or on video calls making plans with to then be actually be able to have that personal connection and, and really share ideas and talk and, and find the joy in in sort of our movement was amazing because I think in the blue zone it was so serious and so depressing. People try to make the climate movement really stressful and serious, but actually the only way we'll get forward is will go forward as if we find joy in it and, and we find hope and we can have those connections with each other because it's a human crisis. Um, so to sort of strip that away like the Blue Zone did and make it very clinical and sterile was just the completely the wrong thing to do. COP was dubbed as this one last chance to save the planet. And that's not true because every day is a chance to make a difference. Um, and also we're not going to save the planet, we're actually saving ourselves, we're saving humanity and, and, and a livable future because the planet will be just fine without us. So I think though that messaging is very wrong. But I think even if it was that one last chance to save the planet, I think it really highlighted that to me and I think many other people who almost give the, gave the politicians that one last chance thinking, you know, I hope this will be different. I hope this might be the one, for whatever reason, that change will happen and it'll be meaningful and it will be, we'll get straight to the point and start happening now. Um, and because that didn't happen and it was just like every other cop, a, a failure and full of empty promises and, and, and lack of action, it really highlighted that actually Politics is all, all, is all fine and, and will make change, but people really do have the power. And I think it kind of made many people turn away from that political sphere and actually just put their energy into causing people power to make a difference. COT26 was the so-called heart of power for two weeks global leaders coming together to save the world, yet turning their backs on the halls of people banging on their doors. 
asking and demanding for their futures. I don't have the answers to the climate crisis. I'm not the hero of this story, but as a collective, we have power. We can listen to each other. We can learn from each other. In her letter to me, way back at the start of the ride, nine-year-old Polly said she hoped everyone I met on the journey to COP is as passionate and caring about the environment as she and I are. Well, Polly, I can tell you that they were and that we can change the course of our future. But to all the politicians and decision makers out there, the clocks are striking 13, and you haven't even looked at your watch. Oh no, anxiety creeps up on me. Is this how it's supposed to feel? Tell me when it's over, I got some place that I gotta be. It won't leave. My friends, hey, get out of your comfort zone, it's a blessing in disguise. Get out of what you call home, your name is written in the sky. It might feel just like you're on your own, but baby, it's another lie. Remember, you are made. I try to work. 